ஷேத்தானின்ஜீம்ஸ்மில்லாஹின்ஹமதுல்லாஹிரபிலாலமீன்ஹமதுல்லாஹில்லதிஹதானலிஹாதா வமாக்குன்னாலினஹ்தரிய
But then the next stage of this dua, Allahumma inni aftatiha thana'a bihamdik, wa anta musaddidun lis sawabi bimannik, wa aykantu annaka anta ahrahum al-rahimina fi mawdu al-afu al-rahma. These sections were divided into four categories of praise. First one for my guidance, the second of your grand mercy, the third in regards to the law that you have prescribed upon me, and the fourth in recognition that you are superior over all those who consider themselves to be superior. The enemies of yours, you are superior over them in all circumstances. Now having considered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grandiosity, having recognized that when it comes to the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are outnumbered. When it comes to looking at their financial resources, maybe we are fewer. When it comes to looking at how they're in control of media, we see that we do not have this in the same scale of them. I recognize that in comparison, I do not have what it takes to make this equal battle. But I recognize that you are superior to all of them in these circumstances. Having recognized his grandiosity, it becomes the natural consequence for me to humble myself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't even have strength against my enemy, but you have greater strength than them. If I can't even fight the enemy, imagine how low and insignificant I really am. And having humbled yourself, having recognized who I am in comparison to this grand creator and sustainer, I now turn in supplication to him. I have concluded this point of praise. I now go into seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma adhinta li fi du'a'ika wa mas'alatik. My Lord, you are the one who have allowed, permitted me to knock at your door. You are the one who has allowed me to seek from you whatever it is that I want. There is no curtailing. There was no saying you can seek for me in this circumstance or in regards to this issue, but I will not listen to you in regards to these issues of your life. When you come, come to me as you are. Come to me with whatever it is that you need. You have permitted me. Imagine now you're working for an employer. Sometimes when it comes to this contract or your obligations, you're required to fulfill first. You are required to have stayed a number of months or a number of years before you're allowed to ask for an increase in your sustenance. Or when you come to him and say, I'm now worthy of being given more within my position. But this isn't an employer in the same way. He says, come when you want. My door is open to you. There is no limitation as to how or when you can seek from me. Allahumma adhinta li fi du'a'ika wa mas'alatik. You have sought du'a and mas'alatik. These are two different things. The Imam specifies that we have been given grant for both these two issues. I am allowed to seek in supplication and in normal asking as well. This points out that how Imam wants us to strategize, become aware of our methodology of seeking. Maybe the dua has a more formal context to it. Whereas the seeking has no formality to it. If I am walking, I can come and seek. If I am driving, I can seek. If I am putting on my socks, I can seek. There is no limitation as to when I can converse with my Lord. It is both dua and mas'alati. It is both of them. Now here, we can again highlight this relationship with our Imams and how we seek intimacy with our Imams. Inshallah, especially in our du'as that we recite before iftitah, we ask my Lord, we seek that you grant me Hajj this year and every year in our du'a, don't we? Just before du'a iftitah. Now of course, we're not just seeking Hajj, we are also seeking the great pilgrimage to the master of the martyrs, Abi Abdullah al Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa And therefore, firstly, when we seek this dua, do not forget to extend the request to ask for Ahl al-Bayt ziyarat as well. We have these traditions. One comes to us from our sixth Imam, peace be upon him, in which he's narrated to have said, it is spiritually compulsory. He uses the word wajib. It is spiritually wajib for the rich person to perform the ziyarah of Abi Abdullah al Hussein twice a year. And it is spiritually wajib for the person who is poor to perform the ziyarah of Abi Abdullah at least once a year. 
Can you imagine the emphasis that is being placed upon here? In the same way that when I approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is the formal seeking of du'a, and there is the informal seeking of du'a, there is also the formal and the informal visitation of my Imam. When I stand in front of Abi Abdullah, or any of the Grand Masters of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all, there are certain formal practices that I am required to do. I will stand in front, of course I will perform my ghusl. Of course I will stand and I will seek permission to enter into the dhari, the courtyard of Aba Abdullah I will recite the formal ziyara that has been recommended to me. But at the same time, as much as I recite the formal ziyara to the Imam, I am also required to engage with him informally as the master that he really is. The Imam knows me better than I can ever know myself. My Imam knows my history better than I know my own history. He knows my present and he knows my future better than I will ever know my future. When I come to the door of the Imam, there is a formal statement to him. And then there's the annihilation. The time when I say to him, Ya Imam, oh my Imam al Hussein, thank you for having invited me to your door. I crumble at your feet. I am nothing but a slave in front of you. Accept me for who I am. This is the difference between the formal and the informal. In the same way, the Imam is suggesting this idea when it comes to du'a iftita. Allahumma adhin talifi du'a'ika wa mas'alatik. I come to you formally and informally. You have given me permission to have supplication formally and this seeking from you informally. I understand that on the Thursday night, I will seek formally in Da'a Kumail. But when I get back into my car, it doesn't mean that my communion with you all of a sudden stops. Am I really going to confine my discussion with Allah Ta'ala to the four walls of the masjid or the Imam Barakha? My Imam says that I am seeking from you formally and informally. Allahumma inni, Allahumma, uh, Allahumma adhin talifi du'a'ika wa mas'alatik. Fasma' ya sami'u midhati wa ajib ya rahimu da'wati. Fasma' listen to me. Ya sami'u midhati wa ajib ya rahimu da'wati. Oh the one who hears, respond to me. Oh the one who is going to respond, come back, give to me, understand my prayer and respond back to me when I seek from you. Now here the Imam is actually using two of the asma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fasma' ya sami'u midhati. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as sami'. He is the all hearing. And he's also mujib al-da'wat. He's the one who responds back to this. Wajib ya rahimu da'wati. The Imam is using these very two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the way that he is trying to emphasize that when we correspond, when we speak, when we seek from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we engage him intimately with his own names and his own attributes. The best way to seek from Allah is knocking at his door, but speaking to him through his own name. The same way you and I is do if we're going to be speaking to our father or the father is going to speak to his son. There is a title that is used in intimacy. There is a name that is used in intimacy. It adorns yourself with respect. Look at how the prophets, peace be upon them, used to speak to each other. For example, in Surah Al-Yusuf, when Ya'qub and Yusuf, peace be upon them, speak to each other, they do so by speaking to each other through their titles and attributes. Ya Abati, inni ra'aytu ahad ashara kawkaba wa shamsa wal qamara. Wa ra'aytuhu li sajideen. Ya Bunayya, la ta'khud. Here, when they speak to each other, they speak to each other with great intimacy. Oh, my dear father, I have seen in a dream this taking place. Oh, my dear son, in response. They adorn themselves with each other's titles. The same way if my father wants to speak to me, he will say to me with intimacy using my name, Oh, Ja'far, can you go and do such and such? Having brought this name or the title, it seeks to bring about the intimacy, the relationship between the two. Similarly, the Imam suggests that when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, use his names. 
My Lord, you are al-Razaq, therefore I am in need of risk, give to me risk. My Lord, you are al-Sami'ah, therefore listen to me, because you are the one who listens to all the prayers of those who seek from you. But the Imam goes further. فَاسْمَعْ يَا سَمِيعُ مِدْحَتِي وَأَجِبْ يَا رَهِيمُ دَعْوَتِي When he says فَاسْمَعْ in the Arabic language, this is adorned with the intimacy of etiquette. In the Arabic language, as we know, there is a command. فِعْلُ الْعَمَرِ The Imam didn't say إِسْمَعْنِي For example, if I am giving the discussion here and people are talking, you might say إِسْمَعْنِي Listen to me. It's a command. Stop what you're doing. Listen to me. There is an authority that is being given to the statement in the Arabic language. The Imam, when addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, didn't say, Isma'ni. It wasn't a command to his Lord. He said, Fasma' ya Sami'u Midhati. I humble myself in front of you. It is an adab the way I am asking you. Please, my Lord, I recognize that you are the all hearing. Therefore, lend your ear to me when I speak to you. This is how the Imam engages his Lord. How would the Lord turn you away in this circumstance? How could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reject such an intimate discussion being made towards him? How could he look upon you and say there is reverence, love, humility, but having seen and observed my created aspiring to me in this nature, how will I turn away from you now? Allahumma. أَذِنْتَ لِي فِي دُعَائِكَ وَمَسْأَلَتِكَ فَاسْمَعْ يَا سَمِيءُ مِدْحَتِي وَأَجِبْ يَا رَحِيمُ دَعْوَتِي Here the Imam is showing that he has confidence in his Lord. I know you are the one who has said, call upon me. And I know that you are the one who has said that when you call, I will respond. And therefore when I seek, I seek with absolute confidence that you are the one who is going to give me. Now this is key to the etiquette of du'a. Take a second, reflect for a moment. List the three most important du'a that you have in your life right now. Whatever they are. They might be health. Indeed, amongst us tonight, there will be people who are unwell. It might be that there are problems within the family. It might be that you need greater sustenance. You don't know where next month is going to come from. It may be that you have a certain weakness spiritually that you have been fighting for the last year of your life. For whatever reason, I am unable to overcome it. No matter how much I have sought, I am weak, my Lord. Whatever dua that you have now in front of you, recognize that when the Imam supplicates, he supplicates with confidence in front of his Lord. It's not that I'm asking you, but I think, you know, I've been asking for these last three months, but I haven't seen any response yet. And therefore, I'm not coming with full confidence. No, be entirely confident that your Lord is not just listening, but the fact that he is permitted to be the one who is seeking dua. Why would he seek dua if he is not willing to respond back to you? When the Imam supplicates, he supplicates with full confidence that his Lord will listen and respond back. Shaheed Mutahari has a story. He recounts about a worshipper, an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how he went through this motion of having confidence and losing confidence. And how Allah ta'ala responded to this abd when he began to lose confidence in him. The story says, one day this worshipper, this Abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to increase his worship of Allah. He was a worshipper of Allah, but he was normal. He was one who would perform his wajibat, but maybe he wasn't one who would perform more of the mustahabbat that he could perform. For whatever reason, this worshipper felt within his heart that he should now increase his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would continuously make dua. He would increase his tasbihat. He would engage in the night prayer. He would recite Quran. He would increase his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As such, each night, he would spend a little bit more on the prayer mat. So for example, on the first night, he would spend half an hour seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second night, he would go to 35 minutes. 
After a week, he would go to an hour. And each night, he would begin to increase and feel in his heart that there was more to do in front of his Lord. Having now worshipped his Lord and really given his all to his Lord, Iblis comes to him. Satan presents himself. Here, we can take this literally or we can take it metaphorically. When we seek from our Lord, Iblis doesn't need to come to me in front of me. He may come in my heart and give me waswasa. So Satan came in front of this man and started to give him this waswasa. He started to whisper ill intention into his heart. He said, Oh Abd of Allah, each night you've been seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more and more. Each night you have been knocking more and more at his door, increased from 30 to 50 to one hour. Have you responded? Have you heard a response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You've been asking. You had this da'a and this da'a and this da'a. You have been doing more and more worship in front of him. You recited more Qur'an, Salat al-Layl you've started. But have you got a response from your da'a yet? Have you heard a response from your Lord? Iblis gave this ultimate waswasa. He said, had you have knocked at the door of any king of this world, the length of time that you had been knocking, surely you, have got a, you would have got a response by now. This waswasa may come into our hearts as well from da'a. I have been asking and I have been asking and I have been asking, but still I haven't received a response. The worshipper decided to close the prayer mat, put away the books of da'a, put down the tasbih, go to bed early. Instead of fulfilling his hour or hour and ten tonight, after 20 minutes he closes his musalla, goes to bed. In a dream, that night he hears a voice, Oh my dear servant, why did you close your prayer mat early tonight? Why did you stop seeking from me? The Abd responds using the same words that Iblis had used in the waswasa. Note how we also use the waswasa. We argue on behalf of Iblis. I hear Iblis's argument and I consider it to be correct. I use these words in front of my Lord. He said, my Lord, I had been knocking at your door every single night. I had increased my worship and servitude of you, but I had not heard any response to my prayer. I had not felt closer to you. I had not felt that there was more proximity between you and I. The voice responded, Oh my dear servant, you have misunderstood your worship altogether. The very fact that you were increasing your worship every night, the very fact that you had been wanting more and more proximity to me, was my response to you in the very first place. That is how you and I communicate. The fact that within your heart you want me, is me speaking to you. That is how you and I communicate. That is how you know I am responding to your da'a. You may not see it physically. You may not see it tangibly just yet. But I am the one who is responding in your heart. And that is when you should know I have responded to your da'a. Is this how we understand our relationship with our Lord? Shah Ramadan. My Lord, Shah Ramadan. He is calling open-armed. Now here in this du'a of iftitah, there is the most heart-rendering statement that the Imam makes. Ya Rabbi, innaka tad'uni fa'uwalli'ank, wa tatahabbabu ilayya fa'atabaghadu ilayk, wa tatawaddadu ilayya fala'aqbalu minka. My Lord, you are the one who calls me. You are open-armed. You have increased Rajab to Sha'ban to Shah Ramadan. You have come to the point when you have said there are no more veils between you and I. But yet I have the audacity to reject you. You are the one who shows me such abounding love. I haven't even understood the word love. And therefore I reject it entirely. Whereas the Imam starts his du'a humbled. My Lord, you are so powerful. I have no weight in front of the enemies of the world. You are so great. 
Yet, despite you having so many millions of people to look after, despite you having every creature, small and large, to look after, you are the one who is in authority of the most distant of suns. I am not even a speck of dust in this earth. You have said, call upon me and I am the one who will respond back to you. Yet, I don't have confidence in my Lord. Does it add up? Does it stack up? My Lord, I am nothing. I am the worst of creatures. You know me so well, so intimately. I am naked in front of you. I am so bare. You know everything about me. One hadith al-Qudsi says, O oh, son of Adam, if the people knew about you, what I know about you, they wouldn't even consider you worthy of the word salam to you. When you're walking, they wouldn't even come and give you salam. They would want to run away from you if they knew the sins that were engulfing you. Yet, yet, I am the one who is open-armed in front of you. I am saying, come, ask, seek, knock, don't stop. I am constantly listening to you. If only you realized how much I want you to be close to me. How much I want to give you. Imam, in this light, in this light is really giving us the confidence to really ask, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever it is that we need. And here again we must contextualize what it is we should be asking for. When I stand in front of my Lord, He knows everything that I need. Before I open my mouth, if I am in need of good health, He knows I need good health. He is the one who has allowed me to fall into bad health. If I'm the one who is in need of sustenance, he knows I need the sustenance. He's the one who has straightened my sustenance in the first place. But when I ask from him, what are the most important things that I should be asking for? The first that I should be asking for in significance are others before myself. I should be asking for the awaited savior of my time. I should be asking for those people around the world who are in more need than I. I should be asking for my community welfare. I should be asking for those people who have served and looked after me. I should be asking for those teachers who have taught me. I should be asking for my parents and my marhumeen. If I do not have the etiquette to remember an other before me, why should I expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remember me before another? I should be looking for the other person before me. In that famous, famous tradition of the Lady of Light, Zahra, peace be upon her, and her son, Imam Al-Hussein, salawatullah wa salamu alayhima. We see that the Lady of Light is in her salat al -layl. The Imam is watching and observing her, performing her Salat al-Layl. Before even giving us the rest of the tradition which we know so well, look at the emphasis of how the child should be observing the ultimate ethic from the mother. In our families, how often does this take place? That the son can wake up at night and hear the mother or the father in whispered prayer to their Lord. What a good circumstance to find yourself in. What a good ethic to set for our children. It is 3 a.m. TV is off. Let us come and pray together. Watch and observe how I pray. And tomorrow I will let you pray. And I will watch and observe how you pray. I will make sure that you have got this prayer right. Lady Zahra is reciting her dua. She is engaging in this tasbihah. At the end of the prayer, Imam والسلام, the young boy says, Oh my dear mother, why is it? I didn't see you asking for me and my brother Hussein. She responds, Oh my dear Hassan, neighbors first and then the family. We remember those others outside us and then we remember ourselves. This is how we engage in the dua before. The Imam actually goes a wonderful step further in Da'a Ifita and qualifies the best way of seeking in order to ensure that the prayer is accepted. 
اللهم أذنت لي في دعائك ومسألتك فاسمع يا سميع مدحتي Listen, please, my Lord, to my praise. Midh. Midh, the root word from the word maddah. Maddah is equivalent to the dhaqirin. It is those people who go and praise. The are those people who sit on pulpit, they stand, and they give the remembrance of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all, in the Holy Quran. The maddah in the Arabic language are similar, it's an equivalent. They are also like the dhakirin. The maddah will also give praise. They are the ones who give the praise of Ahlul Bayt. Al Imam is saying, My Lord, when you listen to my prayer, Fasma' ya sami'u midhati. Listen to my praise first and then respond back to me. Showing us the sequence of how the dua must be. I praise first and then I expect the response back from you. The very best praise that one can give to ensure that du'a is accepted is the salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad before the du'a and after the du'a. Why? Because the salawat is a du'a in itself. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum is a du'a in itself. Oh Allah, send blessings upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad and hasten the reappearance of the awaited Savior. If I start my du'a with a blessing upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad and the ending by the blessings upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, the du'a in the middle will be accepted. Why? Because Allah will never reject the first du'a. He will never say, no, I'm not going to give you the blessings upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Of course, he will send the blessings upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Therefore, if he is bound to accept the first du'a from you and he is bound to accept the last du'a, of course, being an all-encompassing Lord, how will he reject the middle du'a, the one that I'm actually seeking for myself? You start by sending blessings upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, the praise. Fasma' ya sami'u midhati. Listen to my praise, then my du'a, and then I conclude with the praise, knowing that he is going to accept from me. It continues. Allahumma adhinta li fi da'aika wa mas'alatik Fasma' ya sami'u midhati wa ajib ya rahimu da'wati Wa qil ya ghafulu athrati Fakr ya ilahi min qurbatin kad farrajtaha Wa humumin kad kashaftaha Wa athratin kad aqaltaha Wa halkati balain kad fakaktaha My Lord, how many sorrows have you removed? How many trials and tribulations have you dispelled from me? How many ill circumstances have you mitigated from me? Now here, this is a huge admittance before our Lord. Reflect for a second, my brothers and sisters. Go through your life. How many problems, trials and tribulations have you and I had in our life? when we felt that there was no way I could find a way out from this circumstance. I am completely helpless. I have done something, it was my fault. Or maybe it wasn't my fault and a circumstance befell me. My Lord, I am completely helpless. I have no one to turn to but you. In these circumstances, I remember my Lord, Fakam, how many uncountable circumstances I am unaware, I've lost count of how many you have aided me in. Now here, there is a, an ethic that we, inshallah, can try to adopt within ourselves. Our sixth Imam has an outstanding tradition when he says, تَخَلُّكَ بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Adopt for yourself the akhlaq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has an akhlaq, He has an ethic, He has an adab, He has an etiquette within Himself. The way He acts, upon his creation, upon those Muslims, the non-Muslims, everyone included. The sixth Imam says, adopt for yourself the akhlaq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he is the all-forgiving, you should be the all-forgiving. If he is all-merciful, you should be as merciful as possible. If he is the one who is unending in giving, try to be the one who doesn't have a limit to your own giving. Adopt for yourself. Meaning in this du'a, you are the one. How many of these calamities have you dispelled from me? 
How many times have I seen in my life when I've been unable to be helped by anyone from my family and friends, but you, my Lord, stepped in. Therefore, I should be this kind of human being to other people. In my friends and family, in my community, I should be the one who when I see a problem, I should go about and dispel the problem of my friend and family. Unfortunately, sometimes within our community, we find a person, when someone comes up within the community, someone wants to pull him down. When someone is successful, they look at him with envy. I had asked for that same thing in my supplication. Why wasn't I given it? By the fact that you're envious, you're not worthy of having that thing in the first place. No wonder you haven't been given it. Here, we should have that ultimate ethic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is pleased when someone is achieving. We should be pleased when someone is achieving. When someone is in dire need, he steps in to aid. I should be the one who steps in to aid that person as much as possible. Our Holy Prophet of Islam has a tradition. He says, the individual, the person who stops a calamity befalling upon anyone in this world, Allah will ensure that there is no calamity for that person in the next world. It's a very simple equation. It's a give and take. If I am the one who is able to aid my brother or sister, then Allah will step in and aid me at a time when I'm most in need of it vis-a-vis -vis the next world. When I have no chance now to change the outcome, when he is the one I am reliant upon in changing within this outcome. We find these du'a in Shah Ramadan are instilling this ethic in us. Allahumma adkhil ala ahli al-qubur al-suru. Allahumma aghni kulla thaqeer. Allahumma ashbi' kulla jaa'i'. Allahumma aksa kulla uriyan. Allahumma aghdidayna kulli madeen. Here, these lines are profound. Oh my Lord, enrich every poor person. Feed every hungry person. Now when I recite these du'a, how do I think is the response to these du'a? Do I think to myself, my Lord, because I've asked for this, my Lord, enrich every poor person. Do I think that the poor person out on the street, all of a sudden Allah Ta'ala is going to drop a bag of money in his lap? I've made this supplication. Allahumma aghni kulla faqir. Oh my Lord, enrich every person. Do I think that Allah will drop a bag of money to that person? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be responding and saying, Oh my servant, I hear your dua. You become my hand on earth and you enrich the poor person. Oh my Lord, feed every hungry person. No problem, Ja'far. You have asked the dua. What have you done to feed that very hungry person before you come and ask me? Oh my Lord, Allahumma aslih kulla fasidim min umul al muslimin. Oh my Lord, reform for us the situation of the Muslim Ummah. Iraq, 110 people and counting, bombed, murdered, shot to death today. Syrian people, our brothers and sisters, people going into their houses and shooting them because they are the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Scholars releasing statements that we should bulldoze over Sayyida Zainab People in Yemen fighting for an opportunity to just have a little bit of say within government. People in Bahrain being captured and tortured. Shuyukh Ayatollah al adama al-Sheikh al-Nimr within Saudi being taken, ambushed beaten where his own family say we can see marks of torture upon his head in the state where he's now on hunger strike when we raise our hands and we say Allahumma aslih kulla fasidin min umur al muslimin do I believe that my Lord is actually just sitting metaphorically on the throne and saying indeed no problem I will change everything the concept of the du'a is that we are the ones implementing. We become the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. We have to become strategic. We have to become aware. We need our youth to be engaged, emboldened, participate. I'll give you an example of what takes place. Sometimes when we go on marches, when we go on marches, we go to a particular embassy, and we stand outside the embassy hoping for the rights to build Baqir, to rebuild and to give us the rights back. 
when you go on these marches, observe the ethic of certain people. When they go and they're standing out a certain embassy that you are seeking betterment from, you are asking them, improve your akhlaq towards Ahl al-Bayt. But we have lost our akhlaq when representing Ahl al-Bayt. I have seen people throwing eggs at the door of the embassy. I have seen people giving la'na upon certain personalities that they hold dear towards the embassy. Do you think that person within the embassy is genuinely going to take upon our request? If I'm throwing eggs, is that really the way that we are going to bring about this reformation, to bring about the change, the islah within the Muslim ummah? There is an ethic that takes place. Takhalluka bi akhlaqillah, the sixth Imam says. The fact that you are the one, my Lord, who has stopped so many of these trials and tribulations from taking place in my life, I take that responsibility to become such a human being where I will perform the same within my community. When I see someone who is in need, I will be the first to go out and help them. To the extent that the Holy Quran says within Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 280, that if you are the one who has lent someone money, and the debtor hasn't got the ability to give you the money back, the first thing you should do is give them respite. Next, if they still haven't got the ability to pay them back, you should forego it altogether and give it to them as a charity. This is how people step in to help each other. This is how you stop a calamity, a burden from taking place. The Holy Prophet of Islam loved people so much to the extent that the verse 128 of Surah at tawbah was revealed about him. It said that the Prophet was the one who was sent from amongst you. And it pains him so much that he sees you falling into problems. When he sees anyone, Muslim, non-Muslim, Shia, Sunni, Bahura, Ismailiyah falling into problems, it pained him, it killed him inside to see someone falling into problems. How much we can do more for our particular community. We conclude with one story of the Holy Prophet. Verse number 6 of Surah Al-Kahf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse that said, O oh Muhammad, you will kill yourself with grief. It doesn't mean suicide. It means the burden, the pain that is going through the heart. You will kill yourself with grief because of how much these people don't believe in your communications. The reason for the verse, the reason for revelation of this verse, someone came to the Holy Prophet of Islam with a gift. They came and gave him a red abba, a red cloak. It was the most beautiful of cloaks that anyone could give to the Holy Prophet of Islam. The moment he got that cloak, he went straight away and took it knocked on the door of Abu Jahl. Who is Abu Jahl? The biggest of enemies in Islam. He knocks on the door of Abu Jahl and gives to him this particular cloak. Oh Abu Jahl, here is a gift for you. Abu Jahl scorned him. I don't want your gift. I don't want you. I don't want your relationship. I don't want your religion be gone from here. The Prophet, all he wanted was an opportunity to engage all he wanted was to show the highest of ethics. All he wanted was for one opportunity to show you who I am so that you may come towards the religion of Islam. As a response, the Prophet had to turn away. He was pained so much in his heart at not being able to guide, not being able to bring someone towards the truth. Allah Ta'ala revealed a verse about him. You will kill yourself with grief. You will be overcome with grief for how much you want this person to be guided. This is takhalluka bi akhlaqillah. Allah Ta'ala's arms are open. Come to me, ask me, seek from me. I am here to give you that guidance. I'm here to uplift you. I recognize how weak you are. I recognize what you want within your families and communities. Seek from me because I am the one who wants to give to you. Allahumma adinta li fi du'a'ika wa mas'alatik Fasma'a ya sami'u milhati Wa ajib ya rahimu da'wati Wa aqil ya ghafur ahlati Please raise your hands and join us in du'a We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Earnestly and through the wasilah of the awaited saviour We ask you ya Allah Hasten his reappearance Allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death If we are to pass away from this world before 
we are able to see his coming raise us from our graves so that we may be alongside him and partake in that victory we ask for you, Allah through the wasila of the awaited savior and the holy Quran that there are many people around the world who are in desperate need there are people in Afghanistan in Iraq people in Pakistan people in Mexico people in Nigeria people in Saudi Arabia Bahrain Palestine Ya Allah, give them safety, security, medicine, education, and victory. We ask you, Ya Allah, through the wasila of the awaited Savior, to forgive our sins, the sins of our parents, all those whom we love, all those that love us, all of our marhumeen, and all of our ulama. We ask you, Ya Allah, through the wasila of the awaited Savior, allow us to perform the ziyarat of Ahl al-Bayt. Help us to achieve in this month, as we are trying to achieve in this month. And we ask Ya Allah for the opportunity to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. A very quick reminder that tomorrow, inshallah, we will commence our tafsir series, which is going to be practical techniques towards pondering upon the Holy Quran. We will look at several methodologies of how to ponder, build upon those ponderings, and when we come to conclusions of our ponderings, how do we know if those ponderings are correct or incorrect? And how do we ensure that we can get the very best from the Holy Quran within this month and the rest of our lives? Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May I ask you to recite one loud salawat in honor of the awaited Savior, Imam al-Hajj, ajjalallahu ta'ala, farajah sharif. Allah.